Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, Greg, very much for inviting me and Alex for um, organizing my visit. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I always love to talk about drug policy, but um, it's an especially exciting time here with um, some, some new developments at the national level. So um, this morning I'm going to try and be relatively concise so we can, um, we can have a little discussion at the end, hopefully. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the ways that we can use comparative research to answer three questions about Canadian pharmaceutical policy. First question is, how is Canada different from other countries um, with regards to pharmaceutical policy, um, especially compared to countries that are similar to Canada in, in other important ways? And here I think uh, looking to other jurisdictions can act as a corrective to uh, a natural tendency to take our own policies as normal or somehow inevitable. Um, and of course, pharmaceutical policy is one of those areas where Canada is quite different from most other OECD countries. Um, so that's sort of the descriptive element. The second question is one that has been the focus of much of my research, and that is why is Canadian pharmaceutical policy different from other countries? All advanced industrial democracies have to deal with similar problems in terms of the role of the state in the provision of health services uh, and the provision of pharmaceuticals. So why is the solution in Canada so different from the solution in similar countries like Australia and the UK? Finally, uh, what can cross-national comparisons tell us about opportunities for policy change? My research takes a comparative historical perspective on health policy development and uh, looking at countries over a long period of time allows me to identify some patterns in uh, policy reform and stability with regards to pharmaceuticals. So uh, I'll come to that part at the end. First question, um, how is pharmaceutical policy different in Canada? Um, you might have heard that Canada is the only OECD country with a broad public health system that does not include pharmaceuticals. Um, but what exactly does that mean? Um, and just as a just as sort of a small caveat, this morning I'll be talking about Canada mainly in comparison to Australia and the UK because uh, these are the countries where I've done my research and they're the ones I know best. However, uh, these countries were not chosen because I think they necessarily represent um, best practices in terms of public insurance. They're chosen because their health systems, their political institutions, and their policy histories uh, provide some analytical traction on that, that why question um, about explaining the, the causes of variation. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, I won't be making an argument today that we should try and adopt the Australian system or the, the British system wholesale. With that said, uh, we can compare pharmaceutical policies across a couple of dimensions. Um, first, we can ask who's eligible for public insurance. The UK and Australia have single-payer systems with universal eligibility based on residency. Uh, and Canada has a multi-payer system where eligibility varies by province and is based on age, income, or sometimes drug expenses relative to income, uh, and also sometimes on disease status. Many Canadians, um, <coughs> excuse me, have uh, private employer-sponsored pharmaceutical insurance, um, but in 2015, about 20% of Canadians reported being uninsured or underinsured, as in most of their drug expenses were out of pocket. So um, the people in Canada who are most likely to be uninsured or underinsured are those who are young, who um, have precarious employment, so maybe they work part-time or on contract, um, and who live in British Columbia or the Atlantic provinces. Um, there are uh, many other countries that achieve universal coverage within a multi-payer system. Uh, for example, the social insurance systems of Germany uh, and France. Um, but this does have implications for other policy outcomes, as we'll see in a moment. 
Another way we might want to compare um, pharmaceutical policies is to look at how much drugs cost. Um, international drug prices are notoriously difficult to measure, um, but we do know that drug prices in Canada are, are high. Um, the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board recently found that Canadian drug prices are the third highest in the world. So one way to make comparisons um, is to look at per capita expenditure on drugs, which has to do with prices and, and some other factors like prescribing habits, but it can, it can give us um, a bit of an idea. So um, this is a slide that um, my colleague Steve Morgan put together based on um, OECD health statistics. So this is 2013 numbers. In Canada, per capita expenditure was $952, um, whereas Australia and the UK were a bit above and a bit below the $621 average for single-payer systems, respectively. And so in this chart, um, single-payer systems are in the dark blue on the left, and multi-payer systems um, are in the light blue. Can I ask what's included? Are you including in-hospital pharmaceutical costs, and are you including over-the-counter? Um, this one, it's not in hospital. It's, um, it's community um, prescribed drugs. I don't know over the counter because when I tried to update this, I was having trouble disaggregating um, over the counter from, um, from prescribed. So um, I'd have to check on that. No, no, it's an important question. Um, OK, so the cost of drugs um, is related to many factors, but it is linked to policy in some important ways. Um, acting as a single payer gives governments a much better ability to negotiate drug prices. And um, there are other ways to limit drug prices, such as regulating an acceptable profit margin or capping prices for generic drugs. But um, the bargaining power of a single payer is, um, is a big advantage here. A final question we might ask um, about sort of the outcomes of pharmaceutical policy is, are there financial barriers to accessing drugs? A typical way to measure this is to look at rates of cost-related non-adherence, which is just the proportion of people who report uh, skipping medications or not taking medications as prescribed because of cost. The averages um, are, uh, in Canada, uh, about 10% of people report not taking medications because of cost. In the UK, that's 2%, and in Australia, uh, 6%. Um, I think this graph is important, though, because you can see that cost-related non-adherence varies with, the, uh, with disease status. So people with two or more chronic conditions, um, which is the dark green bar, are much more likely to experience financial barriers to, to taking their medications. Um, so, Access is also, of course, linked to policy uh, choices in terms of who is eligible for coverage and, um, and how much people pay for uh, the prescriptions that they get. Um, Australia, you'll see, has relatively high rates of cost-related um, cost non-adherence, <clears throat> especially compared to the United Kingdom. Um, and this may be linked to factors like the relatively high co-payments in that country. Um, which are currently about 38 Canadian dollars versus co-payments about 15 Canadian dollars in the UK. Um, both these countries have a system of exemptions and caps on, this char on, these, um, on these charges, but um, still, you know, roughly $40 that you have to pay for your prescription before the public insurance kicks in is, is a fair amount. can tell spring is coming because I've already got my allergies. So there's, there's hope for warmer weather. Um, OK, so when placed in international perspective then, uh, Canadian solution to the problem of pharmaceutical insurance leaves some things uh, to be desired. And I think there is sometimes a temptation to say, well, if another system is achieving something that we would also like to achieve, like more equitable access to pharmaceuticals or a better degree of control over uh, pharmaceutical costs, we should just do what they do, right? We should 
just be more like the United Kingdom if we want lower rates of cost-related non-adherence. Um, and we can and should learn from the successes of other countries, but we should also remember that Canada is not starting from scratch when it comes to pharmaceutical insurance. And we can't simply um, import another country's model uh, because each country's policy is a product of its history, its political institutions, um, and its attitudes over time. So this leads me to my second question about why pharmaceutical policy is different in Canada. So uh, my research has examined policy development in these three uh, similar Anglo-American democracies over more than 60 years to try and understand why Australia and the UK developed public, drug, uh, public and universal drug insurance and Canada did not. I make two main arguments about this. First, uh, that we can explain a good deal about policy outcomes in a given country by examining the conditions present in a key early period of policy development. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at the post-war welfare moment of the late 1940s and early 1950s. These moments help determine whether a country embarks on a radical program of policy development, for example, uh, adopting a comprehensive universal public health system in one fell swoop, like the uh, United Kingdom did with the National Health Service, or, on the other hand, whether it proceeds more cautiously, taking an incremental approach to policy development and adopting only one element of a health system initially, with the expectation that others will follow later. So Australia did this with the adoption of a national pharmaceutical benefits scheme uh, between 1945 and 1950, and Canada did it with the adoption of nationwide public hospital insurance in 1957. The second argument is that this choice between a radical or an incremental pace of policy development is significant because it shapes opportunities for change in the future. Barriers to change increase over time. Okay? As we move forward in time, it gets more difficult to, to change the policies we have. Um, because private or residual public programs arise to fill gaps in universal coverage. Um, and as I argue, limited ideas about health policy become entrenched among politicians and the public. Australia only implemented public hospital and medical insurance in the 1970s. And even then, the system did not mirror the entirely public administration of the original pharmaceutical benefits scheme. In Canada, attempts to implement nationwide public medical insurance began just nine years after the adoption of hospital insurance, um, but it was still an uphill battle that required significantly more concessions to the provinces than hospital insurance financing had allowed for. Um, and of course, we still haven't got around to, to pharmaceutical insurance. So now I'd like to talk about each of these uh, arguments in a bit more detail um, using examples um, from my research and most of the research that I'll, I'll talk about this morning is, is based in the National Archives uh, of the three countries. So I find that radical policy development is more likely um, when we have three conditions. When political institutions concentrate decision-making power, um, which this morning I'll call power in institutions. When there is a consensus on ideas about health policy held by politicians and other policy elites. Um, so we can think of this as political will. And finally, when health policy development is both popular and salient with the public, um, which I'll call the public appetite for reform. And the salience here is really important um, because lots of people like the idea of um, public health services. Uh, the question is how highly they rank that when they're making their voting decisions. So when one or more factors of, this, uh, of these uh, one or more of these conditions, uh, I should say, is missing, there may be some health policy development, but it will tend to be more cautious, incremental um, policy development. In the immediate post-war period, these conditions were present in the UK, but not in Canada or Australia. So the UK, we have a unitary country with a strong centralized Westminster parliamentary government. So um, power is very much concentrated in the national executive. Um, and this provides an institutional prerequisite for radical change. In 1945, there was uh, a labor majority government for the first time. 
and uh, Labor's ideology with respect to public health services was supported by uh, the Beverage Report, which was published in 1942 and called for comprehensive health and rehabilitation services. At this time, there's also a clear public appetite for reform. Broad, health, uh, broad public health programs were not only um, popular, they were highly salient. And you can kind of see that in this cartoon from 1943. Um, the Beverage Report was uh, political dynamite. There's a remarkable finding in um, Gallup polls that were, that were uh, published shortly after the release of the Beverage Report. 95% of respondents had heard of the report and 88% were in favor of implementing it. So there was a real sort of groundswell of support um, that helped prompt radical reform. So uh, in the UK, these conditions allowed for the radical implementation of a full suite of universal public health services, including drugs, um, over the objections uh, of the medical profession and with surprisingly little discussion of costs. But uh, Canada and Australia did not, uh, did not have these same conditions. So when we think about um, power and institutions in these two countries, uh, they're both federations. But um, at this time, Australian federalism was, was fairly centralized. Um, the states couldn't afford to be particularly independent. Um, and so institutional factors were much more important in Canada. As an illustration of this, um, federal and provincial governments uh, were discussing uh, health insurance proposals at the 1955 Federal Provincial Conference, but Prime Minister uh, Louis Saint Laurent commented that the federal government would not, uh, quote, wish to be party to a plan for health insurance, which would require federal interference in matters which are essentially of provincial concern. Political, concern, uh, political will, sorry, was an issue in both countries. Uh, the Canadian Liberal Party had uh, health policy in its platform starting in 1919, but uh, Prime Ministers Mackenzie King and St. Laurent were both deeply skeptical about um, public health insurance. Similarly, in Australia, the Australian Labour Party was a pragmatic party that wished to introduce uh, some sort of health service, um, but concluded in 1943 that, uh, quote, it is impractical in wartime to devise and introduce a comprehensive scheme for all these health services. Um, so Canadian and Australian politicians were also not being prodded by public opinion uh, the way politicians were in the UK. Although public health, health policies uh, are generally popular when voters are questioned about them directly, um, in order to provide an appetite for reform, we really have to have voters paying attention, right, as I, I said a moment ago. So in Canada, the top of mind issues for voters between 1945 and 1953 were consistently jobs, uh, taxes, and prices. Well, in Australia, there's little evidence of salience and, um, and strong division of opinion along party lines. So um, uh, public health, health insurance was not sort of a bipartisan winner in Australia uh, the way it was um, later on in Canada and uh, many other countries. So as a result, uh, Canada and Australia both took incremental approaches to health policy development, although they chose different services as their uh, first priorities. In Canada, the preferences of the provinces resulted in the selection of hospital and then medical insurance as first priorities. Um, and in Australia, in contrast, pharmaceuticals were the first priority, which is sort of an interesting um, piece of evidence that Canada's decision to place a low priority on drugs is, is not inevitable. Uh, in Australia, the federal government, as I said, wanted to introduce a new program before the end of the Second World War, um, but it was the Treasury who made the decision about where to start, and, uh, and they concluded that pharmaceuticals would be a good starting point because um, these services, uh, again a quote, will not involve any significant additional drain on professional manpower. Um, and at this point, towards the end of the Second World War, um, more than a third of Australian doctors were still on um, active military service. So um, the doctors were not there, and they figured they could do drugs without the doctors, and that would be, that would kind of get the ball rolling. Um, they were wrong about that, as, as I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes here. So 
incremental versus radical reform. The, the conditions are set early on. The second part of my answer for why pharmaceutical policy is different in Canada has to do with um, this idea that incremental processes tend to stall. Early health policy debates in Canada and Australia anticipated adding other services in stages. Um, so why didn't we see a slow but steady progression towards more comprehensive um, public health insurance in these countries? Uh, one type of barrier to further policy development is related to uh, the way alternative institutional arrangements develop in the absence of national action. Private insurance and residual programs in the provinces or states may develop, um, essentially taking up policy space, as political scientist uh, Jacob Hacker has argued. Um, and then these policies resist displacement um, later on when policy reforms are proposed. So just think about the way um, their setup costs to developing these limited provincial plans. There are um, you know, interests that develop um, among private insurance as, as that grows and becomes uh, an important segment of the market. And there are, there are coordination costs, too, of people um, learning this system and becoming experts in this system. And all these things um, make change more difficult later on. A second, um, and I would argue equally important barrier, though, is related to ideas. Uh, recall that Initially, Australia and Canada lacked uh, clear political will for radical health policy development, and they lacked a public appetite for reform. These factors reinforce one another over time. Politicians and policy elites have limited ideas about what health policy can or should do. Um, and in the case of Canada, they also had specific ideas about the unfeasibility of pharmaceutical insurance. This limits opportunities for the public to develop an appetite for reform uh, because the option is never part of the public discourse. So in uh, Australia, explaining the stalled process of health policy development is actually quite straightforward. Uh, the Australian Labour Party attempted to implement its first priority for health services, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, uh, for five years and they were blocked by unexpected opposition from the medical profession. Um, so the medical profession viewed the scheme as part of a slippery slope towards socialized medicine. Um, and although the PBS legislation was passed in 1945, doctors just refused to write prescriptions for reimbursement. Um, so they wouldn't participate and the scheme uh, didn't function for the first five years it was on the books. So 1950, a, uh, a small C conservative liberal country coalition government was, uh, was elected. Um, they were opposed to public health insurance in principle. And, and so the lack of further policy development here is unsurprising, especially since they held office for the next 20 years. What is surprising is that the new government made some minor changes to the PBS, um, placated the medical profession, and finally implemented public universal pharmaceutical benefits shortly after their election. Um, and this is, this is a strange thing. Um, and I argue that uh, their decision is a testament to the power of a clear public appetite for reform. Australians had been promised free prescriptions for five years, uh, and they expected to get them, regardless of the change in government. Um, and the, the opinion polls show that this was a consistently popular reform. Um, implementing the PBS. Um, so Australians got their, got their free prescriptions and then nothing else for, um, for more than 20 years. In Canada, the stalled process of health policy development is a bit more puzzling. Here, the development of um, various proposals, actually for the development of public pharmaceutical insurance, were rejected by the same governing political party that adopted public uh, hospital insurance at the national level and had initially called for a comprehensive program, albeit one that would be implemented in stages. In Canada, um, private drug insurance and limited public programs also developed fairly late. So um, those institutional barriers, at least for pharmaceutical insurance, don't seem to be um, as important. 
Um, instead, I argue that the key explanation for a lack of public pharmaceutical insurance here is about ideas, a lack of political will, and a corresponding lack of public appetite for reform. Uh, so we don't really know why Canadian politicians and officials saw pharmaceutical insurance as fundamentally unaffordable from an early, um, from an early time, um, because this was a different position than um, politicians in Australia and the UK had. However, uh, these ideas were early and, and persistent, and we can see them in a number of national level proposals for pharmaceutical insurance over the years. Going back to 1955, uh, a meeting of the federal and provincial deputy ministers of health concluded that pharmaceutical benefits were, uh, quote, not considered to be feasible at this time. And in 1963, uh, shortly before the Royal Commission on Health Services issued its final report, a federal departmental working group on health insurance suggested that, quote, uh, in view of the difficulties inherent in the control of costs and in light of the availability of drugs provided in hospitals, the pharmaceutical benefits might be excluded uh, from any Canadian medical care program. These ideas carried through the Hall Commission, uh, where pharmaceutical proposals were overshadowed by efforts to introduce medical insurance. Um, these ideas were evident in 1972, when the Federal Department of Health and Welfare prepared a cabinet memo proposing uh, nationwide universal drug insurance that they suggested would also help control drug prices. However, when Cabinet discussed this proposal, it fell back on earlier ideas of pharmaceutical insurance as prohibitively expensive. Um, a minister said, quote, Pharmacare would be the beginning of a very expensive program. Um, and Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau said Pharmacare should be avoided because, quote, of the considerable expenditures involved. Um, which, you know, might sound familiar to people who are reading the news um, now. Uh, there's also a narrative of fixing what we have rather than adding something new. Uh, the President of the Treasury said uh, provinces should be given time to increase the effectiveness of the present Medicare scheme before any significant additions were made to it. So these limited ideas about pharmaceutical insurance and its place in Canadian health systems were also major factors in the failure of the 1997 uh, National Forum on Health proposals and the 2002 proposals for um, broader drug coverage from the Romano and Kirby reports. So uh, Canada lacks public universal pharmaceutical insurance, I argue, because post-war conditions prompted an incremental pace of policy development. Uh, and for somewhat idiosyncratic reasons, pharmaceuticals were initially seen as a low priority uh, that posed special problems of feasibility and affordability. The initial lack of political will and public appetite for reform reinforced one another over time uh, and were the main factors in blocking reform proposals for, um, for about 40 years. So is policy reform uh, possible? My final question um, is about how we might achieve policy reform in Canada based on what comparative research can tell us about conditions for policy change. Um, my research finds that major change is rare, but not impossible, in countries that have taken an incremental approach to policy development. I've discussed the conditions that were necessary for a radical pace of change uh, initially, power in institutions, political will, uh, public appetite for reform, and I find that these same conditions uh, can help reformers overcome barriers to policy change in systems that have taken an incremental approach and can lead to some major policy reforms. Canada and Australia have both had uh, moments of major change since they adopted these first elements of uh, public insurance, although um, neither one involved changes to pharmaceutical policy. They still, I think, demonstrate a pattern in the conditions for major policy change that may be relevant to pharmaceuticals today. So I just want to talk through those major changes um, briefly. In Canada, um, I argue that the adoption of nationwide public medical insurance um, between 1968 and 1972 was a major policy reform. Although uh, planners had anticipated medical insurance as a second priority for policy development, uh, 
And despite coming relatively soon after the adoption of hospital insurance uh, in 1957, implementing public medical insurance in Canada faced barriers that did not exist for medical and for sorry for hospital insurance. It was it was a different game, even though it was only nine years later. These barriers were overcome by uh, a specific and temporary combination of power and institutions, political will, and public appetite for reform. So the barriers, um, there had been a rapid expansion of private physician-sponsored medical insurance in the early 1960s, which meant more opposition from the medical profession and from the plans themselves. Provincial governments had begun to develop their own public plans. Uh, Saskatchewan's universal public plan mirrored nationwide uh, hospital insurance, but uh, Alberta, Ontario, and British Columbia chose to go the route of subsidizing private plans. These barriers were overcome first by uh, new political will on the part of the federal government. The Liberals had been re-elected after a period in opposition uh, with a new leader, Lester B. Pearson, who was more sympathetic to the idea of broad public health insurance than his predecessors, uh, and who was accompanied by a new group of more uh, progressive party members and advisors. The report of the Royal Commission on Health Services, or the Hall Commission, in 1964 provided an idea for political will to coalesce around. It also generated a good deal of publicity and helped prompt a public appetite for reform. Uh, and this public appetite had been conditioned by earlier discussion of medical insurance as a next step. Um, and as uh, Malcolm Taylor has pointed out, as a natural, normal expectation. So people were primed to expect this and the, the new infusion of political will um, helped kind of push it over the top. The combination of political will and public appetite for reform allowed the federal government to overcome uh, the barriers posed by provincial jurisdictions um, temporarily by proposing a more flexible legislative framework um, and significantly by promising funds to cover 50% of the new program. Thus, radical change was achieved and a new health service was adopted uh, although the conditions for change at this time did not extend to pharmaceuticals. Australia's moment for radical change was a bit later, in the 1970s, um, and it involved the addition of both public hospital and medical insurance. Um, however, there are some, some interesting similarities to the conditions that were present in the UK in the 1940s uh, and in Canada in the 1960s with regards to institutions, political will, and a public appetite for reform. So in Australia, the barriers to adding new services were, uh, were really considerable. When the proposals were introduced in 1972, it had been more than two decades since the impl implementation of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, and states had developed uh, very different arrangements for hospital insurance, some funding them fully, some hardly at all. Um, and private insurance had flourished. There'd been a continuous period of liberal government, remember in Australia, the liberals are the conservative party, um, at the national level, um, with a clear ideological preference for subsidizing private health insurance. However, uh, the longer period of private insurance and the patchwork of state services meant that there was more time for problems with the system to develop. Uh, by the mid-1960s, Australians were struggling with rising premiums uh, and reduced coverage from private insurers. As was the case in Canada, public hospital and medical insurance was championed by a party that was seeking to come back from the political wilderness uh, with a new set of policy ideas. When Labour was elected um, under a new leader, Gal Whitlam, in 1972, it was able to take advantage of the growing public appetite for reform and temporarily overcome institutional barriers for, uh, to change, like Canada, which uh, they did, uh, did this essentially by making states a financial offer they could not refuse. So the politics of Medibank, as the Australian system was called, were crucial in subsequent federal elections. The program was adopted, abolished, and then finally reinstated permanently in 1983. Um, so here we have an example of change in a seemingly stable system where, um, where the barriers to reform um, are quite high but I argue um, this was sort of the right conditions for change. So today I've tried to demonstrate the role of comparative policy re research in explaining 
how Canadian pharmaceutical policy is different, why it is different, um, and how we might approach change uh, if we are so inclined. Canada is an outlier when it comes to public pharmaceutical insurance, uh, and our patchwork of programs have implications for Canadians' ability to access drugs um, and our ability collectively to afford them. We can understand Canada's outlier status by looking at its history uh, in comparison to two similar countries that took different paths of policy development, but both achieved universal public pharmaceutical insurance. Um, explaining why Canada is different, I think, goes some way to understanding how it might change. There are striking similarities in the moments of radical policy reform in Canada, Australia, and the UK. Uh, they all involve concentrated power in institutions, political will for a specific reform objective, um, and a clear public appetite for change. Um, the question for, for pharmacare re policy reformers now, uh, then, is what might these conditions look like in Canada in 2018? Thank you. Thank